In this section, I just want to take a few moments to talk about some special cases that you may come across when portrait modelling and to briefly summarise what we did with the George Washington example. The first special case I would like to just touch on is glasses. Although in our example we didn't have to deal with glasses, this can be quite common and maybe something you need to deal with. And if somebody is a, wears glasses full time, then this is as much a part of how they look as any aspect of their face. The way I deal with these is to use whatever set of modelling tools and components I need in order to create three finished pieces. They may be a group of components or baked components, but they would represent the left and the right arm of the glasses and the front face of the glasses, the part that holds the lenses in real life. Each of these would need to be a separate component by the time you were done modelling, and typically if you're modelling these you're going to use more geometric shapes than we would use during the regular face process, so you may well use the two rail sweep or flat shapes or certainly flat shapes with um, somewhat of a rounded edge. Once you have those three components, you can use the component properties menu to change the base height, the tilt and the fade to basically get those to sit just above the level of the face, but following any slope or gradient there is. We don't want steep vertical edges because they won't look good and they won't machine well. Typically I wouldn't model the lenses because Often if they're a regular pair of um, glasses you can see through the lenses and so the want to be able to represent the face, uh, the eyes of the person in the face. So I would normally just leave a hole and have the face underneath that. A special case may be if the person was wearing sunglasses in which case you might actually model the lenses if you couldn't see the face underneath those in the photograph. Next I just want to touch on the hair. In our example, uh, George Washington was wearing a wig, and so it was a very stylized and different hairstyle than we would normally deal with if you were modeling uh, an image from a photograph. So a few tips when you're working with hair. First of all, you don't need to sculpt every strand that is in the haircut. You don't have to try and represent it, partly because you won't be able to machine that, but also it's just not necessary visually for our eyes to do the work to see the type of hair somebody has. Here we've got a couple of examples, an older gentleman at the top who had very uh, thin head of hair and so it was modelled in quite a blurred fashion because that's really how it looked on the photograph. Then below we have a younger head of hair, this is a lot finer hair and so in this case it was important to have some of the strands showing but again it's still really just giving the general flow and the fineness is just brought in by how many of those you can see sticking up so there will be less smoothing in that case. A good way to see how you might model hair on a, a portrait is to look at sculptures, look at drawings and see how artists represent different hair types, whether it's sort of as an illustration or just more generally trying to give the effect of a certain hair without having to model, as, again as I say, all the strands. Typically the best way to model hair is to use the texture component that you create from the image to give it one quick go over with a general smoothing but being careful not to get rid of too much detail. Add and remove material to create extra definition because often there isn't enough definition to show the, the raised up areas of the hair and the recessed areas of the hair. Once you've added that extra material to accentuate what's already there, you're going to finish it off with the smudging and that's what's going to allow you to get the flow and the more general shape as it goes between the strands of hair. Lastly, I want to talk about ears. Again, in our case, we didn't have to really deal with ears. There was just a small part of George Washington's ear that was sticking out underneath the hair. Again, typically you're going to have to deal with these. Certainly with people that have short hair, their ears will be showing. Really, you just follow the same steps as we did with the face. That is to create the vectors for the shapes you see in the ear. So you'd have one for the outer edge, then one for any shapes you've got inside of that. We build up any sub-assemblies for those shapes, building up the, the um, roundness, typically using the 90 degree with the limit height, very much like we did with the detail face shapes in our example. Then finally, using the sculpting and smoothing to combine those different parts to essentially make a model of the ear. So at that point in time, you'll have a finished component which looks like the ear. To integrate that into the rest of the model, you're going to add it onto the side of the head 
and you may need to tilt it in order to get it to go above the hair. In fact, you may need to be quite careful with the order that you have the components um, because you also you need the hair and the ear to kind of merge with each other but then for those to sit on top of the head. So it may be that the hair and ear need to go before the rest of the head shapes and then those two will merge and then they'll add on top of everything else. Once you've got it there, you're going to need to smooth the front part of the ear. That's this area here I'm showing with the cursor. You can see that on these other examples as well, in order to blend it in, because that typically has a smooth transition. Sometimes it may be worth modelling this in a separate session of Aspire if it's a complicated enough model, because it is going to create a number of vectors, and in order to keep things simplified, sometimes it's easiest just to take those vectors, go into a separate session, model the ear, and then just copy and paste the ear component back into your original job part. Finally, just to summarise our whole project, modelling a face portrait isn't easy, uh, it isn't particularly quick, but it's also not impossible, and hopefully if you've worked your way through these tutorials, you can see that with some time and practice that this can certainly be something that's attainable by most Aspire customers. If you work through the steps in the tutorial and take your time, and that time may well be spread over several days or weeks and could easily add up to 8, 10, 15 hours, depending how detailed and how meticulous you want to be, then you're going to end up with a reasonable result. That is going to require a lot of vector creation, a lot of sculpting, and a lot of careful building of the shapes and ultimately bringing them together. To get a good result, the accurate vector creation is incredibly important. If you don't spend a lot of time laying out those vectors during the first stage and making sure that they carefully correspond to the shapes that are in the face and the lines and the detail that you can see, then it's going to be very difficult to build that, that kind of detail into it later, unless you can pull it from the photograph. The process I showed you, we used a painting, but you could use the same process whether it's with a photo or a painting or any good quality image where we're able to extract that texture and see the detail. Also, exactly the same procedure would work with a photograph of a pet as well as it works with people. There are different shapes you have to build and maybe different detail that you're going to do. Um, if it's a pet that has fur, then that's going to be an important part of it. But in the same way as with the uh, portrait of a person, as we looked at it from the start with a photograph where we decided could we pull a, a good quality texture from it and were we able to see the detail if you can answer the yes to both of those questions for a picture of a pet then you'd be able to do the same type of job with that as well and that concludes this discussion of some of the special shapes that you may come across in portraits and also this summary